Hi everyone, it's Jason from Skinny Research and Development, and today we're going to talk about the triple five timer a little more. In the past, what we've done is talk about the triple five timer in a mode called A stable mode. Now, A stable mode is a mode where the output of the triple five timer gives you a clock where it goes up and down and up and down on the output, and we can time things and clock things with it uh, for anything that needs a clock. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a mode called mono stable. And what monostable is, is you have an event that occurs. In this case, it's going to be a high that goes to a low on the trigger pin of the triple five timer. And when that event occurs, we then get a high on the output for a duration that we get to specify. So we'll take a resistor and a capacitor, specify that duration, and then every time that trigger occurs, we will get an output for a specified amount of time. So why is this useful? So let's say you want to build a circuit that turns on a light for a certain amount of time that allows you to get from the bottom of a dark staircase to the top of a dark staircase. Uh, you could press a button, a light could come on and light your way for a few seconds. Or let's say you want to make a doorbell that's active for a certain amount of time. You could take a triple five timer, configure it in monostable mode, and then whenever someone presses the button, the enunciator would go off for a certain amount of time. So the circuit on the table is activated with a button, and when you press that button, it lights the LED for 10 to 11 seconds. So when you're looking at a monostable circuit, what you're looking at is you're looking at a circuit that will take an activity, like a button press, and then give you a sustained activity for a duration that you're going to get to specify. So with that said, it's time to take the uh, grocery bag and uh, we can see how this thing works. The first thing I like to do is go ahead and build out the four corners of the triple five timer because whether you're using a stable mode or mono stable mode, these four corners need to be filled in the same way. Pin one will go to ground. Pin four will go to your power supply. In this case, it's going to be nine volts. Pin eight will go to your power supply. And finally, pin five goes to a capacitor that is then shorted to ground. For this capacitor, I usually use a uh, 0 0.022 uh, microfarad capacitor only because I have those on hand. I think the data sheet says to use a 0.01 capacitor but either one seems to work. The next thing we want to do is build out the trigger. So uh, what we said a second ago was that when there is an event then we're going to have the output go high for a sustained duration and that event is triggered here on pin 2. Pin 2 is actually called the trigger pin and so this is where we're going to put our switch or whatever. In this case, I'm going to put a switch in. So our power source will be up here. That's going to go to a resistor. This resistor is then going to a switch that will connect to ground. And all this connects right into pin two. So what occurs is when this switch goes down and connects to ground, then pin two will see ground and set off this comparator. This resistor that we're going to call R, that resistor is there to pretty much keep that nine volt source or that voltage source from directly shorting to ground. So in this case with R, I'm going to use a 10 kilo ohm resistor uh, for that just to keep uh, this 9 volt source from shorting straight to ground whenever we trigger this event. The rest of the build out is pretty straightforward. We're going to have a wire going from 6 to 7. We're going to have a resistor going from 8 to 7. We're going to call this resistor RA. And finally, we're going to have a capacitor. I'm going to call it C and it's going to go to ground. So these two components are going to determine how long our output stage, our output stays high. So once this event occurs, we're going to have this capacitor begin to charge. And just know that RA is there to kind of govern how fast C is charged because current's going to have to flow from this source through RA into C. So the bigger you make RA, the longer it's going to take this capacitor to charge. Another thing you're going to see in this circuit is RA is here also to keep this voltage source from shorting to ground. Occasionally what's going to happen is this transistor is going to be active and so this voltage source is going to bleed here into ground or, or go through this transistor to ground. RA is also going to keep this voltage source from shorting directly to ground when this transistor is activated. We're going to start the explanation of this thing kind of assuming that we've reached a steady state. So first, know that the output stage right now is low. Okay, So there's no voltage, there's nothing being triggered, it is just at a low stage. The other thing that you want uh, to know is that this transistor, this transistor is activated. So there is voltage here at the base which is causing voltage to flow from this 9 volt source into RA and down into this uh, ground terminal here. So the capacitor is seeing no voltage uh, coming to charge it up. 
Now, if you haven't watched the first triple five timer video, I'll link it on the page. Uh, but that makes sense because if the output stage is low, we know that the output stage takes the output of this flip flop. So if this flip flop is a one or a high, then the output stage is going to be low. The output pretty much takes the inverse of whatever the flip flop gives it. So if this flip flop is outputting a high, it's coming over here and it's turning on this transistor and it's causing current to flow through it. So if this is a high, then that means the output stage is putting out a low. So let's walk through this. Let's look up here at the trigger. When this button is pressed, it's going to short pin two to ground. And all of a sudden pin two is going to see zero volts. Now that pin two goes into a comparator. And from the last video, we know that this side of the comparator, if it's higher, outputs a zero. And this side of the comparator, if the voltage is higher, it's going to output a one. This also is down here. If voltage is higher on this side of the comparator, then it outputs a zero. And the same on this side. Remember also that pin eight here is connected to this nine volt source and it goes down to these three voltage dividers. This point is one third of the voltage of the voltage source. This point is two thirds of the voltage source. So right now, this one third of the voltage source, which would be about three volts, is higher than the zero volts over here on this side of the comparator. So our comparator is going to output a one to this flip flop. On the flip flop, this is the R input. This is the S input. The way the flip-flop works is when R equals zero and S equals one, it's going to output a one. When R equals one and S equals zero, it's going to output a zero. And anytime you have R equal to zero and S equal to zero, it's just going to hold the same state that it had before. And we'll actually see an example of that before the circuit is done. But let's see what the flip-flop is at right now. So the comparator is giving input R a, a one or high. With this comparator, we have two thirds of the voltage source here. And on this side of the comparator, we have no voltage at all because all of the voltage is coming from this nine volt source and it's going to ground right here. So in this case, zero wins out. So zero is gonna come up here. So now R equals one, S equals zero. And so our output here is now going to be zero. That opens up an entirely different state now. If the flip-flop is outputting zero, that means the output state is gonna take that zero, flip it around and output a high. So now our output stage went from a low uh, to a high. So we've, we've gone low and now we're going high for a certain amount of time. As the output stage goes high, this zero that's being outputted by the flip-flop or low is gonna come around to this side and affect this transistor. So this transistor was activated at the base. There was voltage here, but now there's no voltage. So this is going to close off. And this nine volt source is now going to push current through RA and down to the capacitor. And the capacitor is going to start to charge. So this comparator is going to keep tabs on how much C has charged up. Once C has charged up to greater than two thirds of the voltage source, this comparator is going to stop outputting a zero and start outputting a one, or I should say a high. This high voltage level is then going to run down and go to the flip-flop and change S to now be equal to one. Now at the same time S is being equal to one, at some point along the way, you've released this button, right? This was just a momentary switch. So you press this down, it sent it to ground, but you've released this. And once you release it, now the comparator is going to be high again. It's going to output a zero, so R is going to be equal to zero. So now S equals one, R equals zero. The output of the flip-flop is now going to be one. This one comes down here to the output stage. The output stage now is going to output a zero. That high is coming around. It's going to the base of this transistor. It turns the transistor on, and now our voltage is going back to ground. Now you would think that would be kind of the end of the explanation, but it's not quite, because now we have a fully charged capacitor here. Once this voltage hits the base and allows this pathway back to ground, then this capacitor is going to discharge through this direction. So you have this capacitor that's charged to the amount of two-thirds of this voltage source, which is somewhere around six volts. And now as soon as this transistor opens up and allows current to flow, it's going to discharge this way and into ground. As soon as that happens, the comparator is going to notice, and so zero is going to be higher than zero volts, so it's going to allow zero to come up here to S. Now you've got 
R equal to zero and S equals to zero. And what we said before is when the flip-flop is in that state, it's going to hold whatever previous state it had. The previous state that it had was that it was outputting a one. So it's going to continue to output a one even though R equals to zero and S equals to zero. Now we're essentially back where we started and the whole circuit is just waiting on this event to happen again. One thing to know, if you hold this button down and you force R to be equal to one and S to be equal to one, uh, that's a state of the flip-flop that's not really allowed. And so what will happen is momentarily this transistor seems to come on and drain the capacitor a little bit. But this only happened for like an instantaneous moment. It's just enough to discharge the capacitor a little bit. Then the capacitor will start to charge again and the output will remain high. It's not really a state that's desired. So this circuit's really for times when that triggering event is going to be shorter than the duration that you're going to be able to calculate with C and RA. So you want this tr triggering event to be you know, fairly quick and on and off sort of thing. So just to review, the time the output is going to stay on a high level is mostly determined by how long it takes C to charge up to two-thirds of the voltage supply. Now the formula for that is the time is going to equal, looks like I'm going to run out of space right here, it's going to equal 1.1 RA times C. In the circuit I'm about to show you, I wanted a time that was somewhere around 10 seconds. So I picked RA to be 100 kilo ohms, and for the capacitor I picked 100 microfarad. This came out to be a time of 11 seconds. Now if you want to build this with the LED output that I did, what you're going to want to do is take your LED, and it was just a standard red LED, run that through a resistor, and I think I used a resistor of 470 ohm, and then that goes to ground. So let's take a look at the actual circuit now. Here's the circuit build out. Uh, we have the triple five timer in the middle. All of the green wires are wires that are connected to ground. So our four corners, we have pin one going to ground. Uh, over here, after our point 022 microfarad on the voltage control pin on pin five, uh, this, the other side of it goes to ground. Uh, on the top right corner, pin 8, that's for our voltage to come in, so all the voltage pins are using the yellow wire. And any sort of signaling that's going around is carried on the purple wires. Over here is the switch that momentarily allows pin 2 to go to ground, and you can see one side of that switch is carried on this green wire to ground. And the top side of this switch goes to a 10 kilo ohm resistor that goes into the switch. Uh, the other side of that 10 kilo ohm resistor goes along to pin 2 here. This 100 kilo ohm resistor is going between pin 8 and 7. This 100 microfarad capacitor goes off of pin 6 to ground, and you'll see a really small silver wire in there maybe, between pins 6 and 7 that just connect the two of those together. So when this is activated here, the LED comes on, the output goes high, the capacitor is beginning to charge up. As soon as the capacitor gets to 2 thirds the voltage source, it's then going to take and discharge and send this back so that it, uh, the output goes low. So we can see that on the O-scope. My O-scope ha my O-scope has a little bit of delay, uh, so you're about to see it pop up on the screen after I've uh, pressed the button here. There it goes. Uh, and you can see that over here we had a triggering event where the switch sent pin 2 low, and then up here we have where the output then was high for a specified amount of time, in this case, 11 seconds. Now let me move a lead on the circuit here and we'll actually watch the capacitor charge. So I'm pressing the button now, the LED has lit up, and what you're gonna see on trace two is the capacitor charging, and on trace one, you're gonna see the output. And what you'll notice is that as soon as that capacitor charges up, there it is, it drops. So what you see here is that as the capacitor gets to two thirds of the voltage source, the output goes low, it triggers that transistor which then discharges the capacitor. One thing to remember when you're working with circuits like this that involve timing and you're using a resistor and capacitor is that you are at the mercy of the tolerance of those components. With a capacitor that has a 20% error, if it's a 100 microfarad capacitor, it could be anywhere from 120 microfarads to 80 microfarads. That's gonna affect the timing of your circuit. It doesn't mean you can't use those components, just know that your timing could be a little bit off. If this video has been helpful to you, please consider subscribing and liking the video. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments and I will see you next time.